Hi, everyone. Welcome to the IDA Awards Spotlight Series. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Amy Nicholson. I'm going to be the moderator of today's discussion, and we are going to have a great conversation with the team of Cheryl. Before we get started, I would like to offer land acknowledgement coming from where I am here in Los Angeles on the unceded land of the Chumash and Tongva people who have been stewards of this land for generations. Also, be sure to check out the rest of our spotlight lineup at www.documentary.org awards dash spotlight. And I'd really like to thank our interpreter for today, Andrea Lust. Hello. Thank you so much, Andrea. <laughs> now, let's welcome the team of Cheryl. We have director Amy Scott and subject Cheryl Crow. Hello, ladies. Hi. Hi. I kind of want to just jump right in with one of the very first things that happens in the film. Uh, we learned that Cheryl does not read any of her own press. So my first thought was, how is she going to watch this film? Is she going to watch this film? <laughs> I told Amy Scott, I said, you know, I'm going to watch this once and I'm going to hate it because I hate looking at myself. Um, but you know what? Actually, um, Amy and her team, I, I, I was personally moved by um, their choices and the fact that they they did exactly what I'd hoped they were going to do, which was tell the hard story. I mean, nobody wants to see a recap of awards and uh, accomplishments. I mean, I think most people want to see the story of the person. They want to know more about the person behind the accomplishments or behind the, the career. And I knew that I was going to love what Amy would do with, I mean, vast amounts of material from 30 something years. Um, because I'd seen the Hal Ashby documentary and I loved it. And I felt like her choices were so smart and, um, uh, and, and such beautiful choices that um, I, I felt like I was in good hands. So yeah, I watched it. It was still hard for me to get over just watching myself talk. It's not that much fun to watch yourself talk, but, um, but I, I think in the end, um, and I, I'm really proud of, of the story that they they um they crafted from all the just years of experience so yeah amy yeah it was um you know a little terrifying showing cheryl only because um she was cheryl wasn't you know involved in in the process which was was which is what you want when you're making a documentary you don't want that person to go well what about this period of my life or this record because we didn't you know, we didn't go through everything in equal measure. It would be like, you know, a very long, it would be like von Stohern's greed or something. We'd still be sitting here watching it. So it's, um, when we did show Cheryl, uh, we were very nervous, but I mean, you know, I think um, to her credit, like I can't imagine watching my life played back um, because there's hard moments in the film and hard behind the scenes stuff from like tour from, a long time ago um, that you probably didn't, maybe didn't even know were being filmed at the time. Yes. So, and I was like preparing my, you know, stealing and embracing our whole team. Like, well, we might have to cut a lot of this stuff out, you know, and okay, you get, you know, but that, that didn't happen. So it was, and that's when I knew like, oh, she, she's, I mean, I knew all, all along Cheryl means what she says, but it's like, it was very legitimate. Like, I'm not looking to do like this greatest hits, like this is the real story. So we were really lucky. And I do want to let you, Cheryl, correct the record of, of something that gets said in the film. I think it's by Greg in the Michael Jackson section about the tour. He said that your giant hair was a wig. <laughs> I read that that is absolutely not true, that it, that is your hair. Amy, I am very glad that you brought that up because he was sorely mistaken. The hours in the hair and makeup chair to accomplish that giant hair from the late 80s, early 90s was not a wig. There, you heard it from my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> now, Amy, I wanna ask like, you know, when you're in prep as you're like really just digging into all things Cheryl, learning more and more and more and pulling out bits of her story, was there like a fact, a moment, something you realized that you were like, yes, this is why this documentary needs to be made? Oh my goodness. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I always felt like that because I, I just didn't, I don't feel that there's enough stories of women that have over, overcome so much. Like I'm always looking for these stories that are not 
um, glamorized. I mean, there's plenty of like I love the Amy Winehouse documentary, but there's something about I was I just I, I maybe because I'm raising two little girls, I just want as a story of of hope and a person that I could relate to as a female and an artist. And so I'm I'm always looking for those kinds of stories. And, and pretty immediately on in, in my research, um, to be honest, it probably was when I was digging into some of the press around the, um, you know, the Tuesday Night Music Club and the David Letterman, that whole section, when I was reading some of that, I was like, okay, well, this, <laughs> I, don't know. I didn't like it and I wanted to know more and I wanted to, I was like, this seems really, um, I don't know, there's more of a story here to tell, so. Um, yeah, but it made about a million other points along the way too. <laughs> what was the day like when you first met each other? You know, you, you knew this documentary was happening, Cheryl, you'd been really steeped in the world. Then you guys do finally meet. I mean, this is a moment of sizing each other up, I'm assuming. It was, I mean, uh, first and foremost, everything was weird um, because we were in the middle of a pandemic. And, yeah. and also I was very, um, I was hesitant to make a documentary because I've always felt like as much as I've loved documentaries, like I love the Nina Simone documentary. I loved, I mean, there's so many documentaries that have um, inspired me to keep doing what I'm doing. Um, but generally they've been about people that are no longer here. Um, also, I was hesitant because I felt like, you know, in this day and age, almost every vehicle is built in a way to self-promote and I didn't I didn't I mean I'm I'm a really private person and I and I'm not even you know I'm I'm older I'm not even good at social media so um I I chose Amy because and I had not met her I'd spoken to her on the phone I chose her because of um her sensibilities and when I met her um it's kind of funny you know you you don't know exactly what to expect when you meet somebody you have this vision of what they're going to be like and she was kind of like that already I mean she when I first met her um, I could tell she was an artist I could tell she was a music lover but I could also tell that she was a serious uh, filmmaker and that she wanted me to trust her with um, with my story in a way um, that met what I was hoping for which was the story of a lot of really hard moments that inspired the body of work that I have. You know, not just the hits. I mean, the hits are great and the hits have taken me all over the world, but those don't, they, those don't ever tell the story um, of a singer songwriter. The ones that are the deep cuts are the ones that illustrate your, who you are. And I, I immediately really, I, I loved her and I loved her team. And I felt like the questions that she was asking was, I felt like they were right on par for um, not doing a, a really soft piece. I, I, we were so excited to meet Cheryl and, and, you know, mind you, because it was the, the pandemic. So for about a year and a half, no one had, I hadn't even seen my, my crew or like my, my filmmaking family my brothers and then i was like we're gonna go to we're gonna go fly to nashville and we're gonna go stay uh and we're gonna hang out with cheryl crow for two weeks <laughs> it was just so surreal um so we were so excited so it was just a real exercise for us to like be cool like just be just <laughs> don't, don't geek out and cheryl do you remember there was a giant hailstorm that was maybe the second day yes the, the second day we were you guys were here it was so intense and it it was i was concerned with like it's gonna mess up the lighting in the back but cheryl like jumped out of the chair she's so excited like get over here and you guys check this out and we're all standing around looking at these giant you know hail falling and it was such a moment of i was like oh this is great this is really really what you want this kind of energy in the room so we're so lucky it was i mean i it's it's a funny thing i guess people that make documentaries sometimes they they don't become friends with the people that make their documentaries but i really loved love amy and love the crew and felt i felt like we went through something together you know yeah. it was hard it was for me really emotional and um I felt like we went through a lot together. For one thing, those stories aren't stories I've ever told. And they, they were an opportunity for me 
to tell my side of the story, to, to address what's been written about me for years and years, um, you know, to address the fact that I don't read my press for a very specific reason. Um, so it was, it was hard and it was cathartic and it was fun and it was exhausting and it was everything. How, how many hours did you guys sit down together for this kind of centerpiece interview that runs through the 900 hours? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it was a lot, a lot. I mean, ooh, it was yeah. two, two, two trips of two weeks each. And then she was in the chair and those are long days. Like, yeah, break for Seven lunch. Or eight hour days. Yeah. I mean, I would wind <laughs> up falling asleep on the couch at like eight o'clock at night. And my kids would be like, mom, do you have COVID? Like, no, I'm just tired of thinking. Yeah. Thinking is exhausting. Mm -hmm. I mean, to know you wore that outfit that long, that you really had to decide what you wanted to wear for a while. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Continuity <laughs> is, is a drag for someone who wants to be inspired by their wardrobe. <laughs> but I'm imagining like what the documentary really gives you a feel of as you're watching it is of a person who moves to LA, their life changes relatively fast and very, very, very speedily. You get a sense as you're watching this film, you know, that this is your moment to sort of do the reflection that you didn't really have time to do for so long. Is that an accurate kind of read of, of what's happening on screen? Yes, I don't think anybody sits down and really reflects. I mean, I. I I've had a couple of instances in my life where my, the circumstances of my life dictated that. I mean, obviously being diagnosed with cancer was a, was a moment I sort of had to really take stock and I had to like stop everything that had led me to that point to sort of reassess how I got to that moment. And, but I don't know of any, of any occasion where you sit down and you actually dig through um, the memories of your life and, and relive them and, and actually tell the story um, of what happened because I don't know of anybody that really wants to go through that kind of emotion. It's not like you just tell the story and um, it's sort of a recap. I mean, it, it's, it can be, you know, it's a little bit like revisiting a car wreck you're in sometimes it's um, it was hard, you know, um, but in some ways, I feel like I gave myself a gift um, to at least talk about the things that have happened to me. And, and also a lot of what's happened to me um, are things that happen to women all the time in, in business and not just in the entertainment business, certainly in the entertainment business, certainly in businesses that are run predominantly by men. Um, women are going through what I went through and at least now have an opportunity to speak about those things and be taken seriously. But, um, you know, I've come up through 30 something years now of being in my business and some things have changed and some things haven't. And um, to be able to talk about it and come out the other end and give young women or even just young artists um, a glimpse into sticking it out and, and the glory of being able to say, you know, I did, I stayed, I stayed true to myself and I, I, I'm still inspired and I want to keep going. Yeah. I mean, like Amy and all of this footage that you're going through, meaning you're going through talk shows, mm -hmm. interviews in all sorts of formats, concert footage, behind the scenes footage, as you're going through it from, you know, from these, this 30 year period, did you feel like you were almost seeing this own arc yourself of like how the culture has changed in the way that it treats women? <clears throat> Definitely. And, and, and I had to with, withhold, I wanted to, we wanted to do this, my, my editor and producer and I, because we kept finding, I wanted to do a super cut of every talk show host that introduced Cheryl throughout the years, because for the first 20 years, they're like the beautiful, the luscious, the, like it was the, the adjectives to describe her as she walks out on stage were not like the uber talented, the songwriter, the intelligent, like, it's just like, what, I mean, it was, and, and even, you know, guys that we love that are still in business, it's just that they're, it, it, you know, things have only changed very recently, to be honest, because the supercut would have been really long, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, and just sort of the, the questions that, she would get asked. I was, 
I don't know how you did it, Cheryl, for for so long. I'm just we're just ri ridiculous um, questions that you would never ask a man, you know, <laughs> like um, yeah. so, so those were interesting. But we want, you know, it wasn't that 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 wasn't the whole movie. So you're constantly writing the balance of the story that you want to tell and how you want to, you know, the prism from which you're looking at this part of her life, and then you move on. So it was constantly trying to know what that balance was and when to show that and when to pull back but yeah it was pretty interesting to time travel through her life looking at archival well yeah and i found myself really grappling a, little, a bit with that moment where you guys are in 1996 and you show us this moment that you have all of these female singer songwriters dominating on the charts touring together but looking back on that from 2002 it reminds me that like you know female artists can make strides and then the culture can still backslide the way that i think it did for a while after that mm -hmm. And it, yeah, it was, it was yeah, kind of spicy to have like the optimism mixed up with the, oh no, but I know where this goes. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to be around this long, you know? Um, I mean, I feel, for, for one thing, I feel extremely lucky. I feel really blessed. I feel like, um, uh, I also feel really, uh, it's, it's a very strange thing to be like an, um, what do they call it? Um, uh, a legacy artist. I mean, it basically means that you've you've been around a really long time. But also, when you look at how young oriented everything is, how everything is very geared to the young demographic, and the kind of pressure that that puts on a on a woman um, to look young and to stay perfect looking, and um, you know, it kind of defies everything that we're trying to teach um, our kids about what it means to be, um, you know, what, what beauty is and what, what it means to be tapped into something bigger than that. And it's, you know, the whole thing is a bit of a mind fuck. I mean, if I can use that, use the F word and I'll put $20 in the swear jar when I get back up to my kitchen. Um, everything about becoming famous and being in the world of celebrity it is it tricks you it tricks you into sort of believing something that is that you don't even believe about yourself so you're sort of always at odds with the whole the whole uh, dynamic and um but i've been really lucky you know i i feel like i've been around long enough now to sort of not just get my sense of humor back about it but to sort of honor the fact that man i'm old i love it i love my age i love the fact that I'm not trying to write songs for 12 year olds. And I love that there's a, an incredible amount of stuff to write about right now. And there always is. And there is no, there is no handbook for how to deal with being famous. It's, you know, you just, you do the best you can. Well, yeah. And I, I was really struck by how future forward some of the moments uh, in your biography were. I mean, you're very frank here and talking about like Frank Delayo. Um, and, you know, decades before like the me too movement before you even have like the kind of for sure clout where you know you'll be okay you do do that song lyric you know about him in the in the nana song you know like what is it like clarence clarence thomas organ grinder frank deleo's dong maybe if i he had i'd have a hit song like that was courageous to do at that point in your career well, it's funny because I was watching the CNN documentary on Watergate and it's all about G. Gordon Liddy and that's in the song. I mean, I think the one thing that that I would say is that, um, you know, for young artists now and every young artist I've gotten to meet, um, and there are so many great young artists out there. I mean, I, I think right off the bat of Phoebe Bridgers and there are people out there that are writing about hard stuff, that are writing about um, really truthful, deep stuff. and we need that you know we've always needed it and that's never going to go away I mean it may not get played over and over at pop radio but it will live and it will document who we were uh, at, a, at any given moment in time and I'm you know I was really afraid when those songs came out that I would be sued and yeah it was hard you know but um, I don't think you really think about it when you're in the 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 privacy or the sanctuary of your studio. You're not thinking about lawsuits. You're thinking about your experiences. 
So you certainly weren't thinking about Walmart when you named them and for gun violence and then got your album banned, which is so badass. Like, yeah, and also extremely yeah. relevant to talk about today too. Yeah, extremely. Yeah, and you know, it's I I I always I, you know I cite Bob Dylan all the time because I feel like for years and years before I ever wrote any albums, I would always defer to him and go, God, he's he's like the Bible because he writes about stuff and then it seems to still be pertinent today, like what we're going on with politicians who are corrupt and blah, blah, blah. Um, I mean, I guess that's what you want is to be able to write about things that you want to see change. Unfortunately, they don't always change. And the gun thing is just, I, I don't even know what to say about it. Oh. I mean, Amy, talk to me about like weaving in Cheryl's music. I mean, first, I'm just guessing that you had Cheryl's song stuck in your head for a while making this movie. Oh yeah, I still do. And we would make playlists and I'm telling you my mom, my mom will still text me going, I have a new song I want you to add to the playlist. <laughs> um, oh. Well, I, I can't, we, we can't get out of this without mentioning Scooter because uh, Scooter Weintraub is, um, he is, and I know a lot of people that are music heads, he might be the most, um, music lovingest person that I've ever encountered. He's got an encyclopedic knowledge. Yeah. And so um, in terms of like how we wanted to weave the music into the film, a, a lot of that was in, was a, a partnership with Scooter because just, and it would just be a vibe check. Like, what do you, you know, the scene is like, here's the information and here's the story, but the undercurrent is this tone of like unrest or, or we want to drop in this pop hit because we want we want everyone to get swept up in it, but then we want it to kind of turn. And Scooter was so was so fantastic with that. And then it just uncovering sort of the deeper meanings of, you know, like like the song like Weather Channel, just really pop like stopping the film almost to really just hear her play that song and and take those lyrics in. Um, that was that was that, that that stuff is really important to me and and was important to Scooter too. Yeah, you really only twice kind of stopped the momentum of the doc to have Cheryl perform a song, and that's the first one in the one. Oh, believe me, I wanted to do it way more, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's notes. <laughs> yeah, we need we need to have like a um, part part one, part two, part three. <laughs> yeah, we were we were ready. We would have done it. Well, maybe in part three, you can use the interview where, what, I heard that there was an interview you decided not to use where Cheryl's on a horse. Oh my God, <laughs> Cheryl's such a good sport. Yeah, we, well, she's got all these amazing horses and, you know, in a, in a golf cart and, and I have a, a, a DP that's game to get out. And so, yeah, we, at that point in the filming, I think Cheryl was probably happy to just get out of the interview chair. And was... Yes, I would have been happy to like interview off the diving board and, and you know. <laughs> <laughs> but of this like catalog of music the one that I feel like really sticks out in, in the way it was used you know you use it in the opening you bring it back towards the end is you know makes you happy oh. why why that song I mean that that song is everything to me uh when you think about Cheryl's music I mean if there's one standout song because it's it's so I mean it gets you in your heart and and people are like become another person when they're like people become, become possessed when they when, when you see you know when they hear this song it's like a phenomenon um in the coolest way uh like it's really soulful and it's highly creative and then the lyrics are fascinating it's not it's just and like i've always thought was so cool about her music is these songs that sort of creep into the pop charts, but if you're really paying attention to the lyrics, she's pulling some some real fast ones, you know, on you. So it's just an anthemic song. There was no way we weren't going to start and end the movie with it. And it felt like you also used your interviews kind of like music, like you sort of would toggle one in or push it up more towards the front when the moment came, like you know, when you're talking about, say, the fame section, to have somebody like Laura Dern come and be the voice of what it was like, you know, growing up with fame, but also witnessing your fame, that mm -hmm. felt like a very smart choice to make. Thank you. I have a really smart editor and producer that I work with, so. Oh, and you also came out of editing documentaries, too. That's you know what you're doing. You know your way around an edit board. That's true. <laughs> yes, she does. She definitely does. 
Now, why did you decide to introduce, you know, your parents, Bernice and Wendell, halfway, like halfway through the film? Oh, you know, we had a cut where, as you do, you have the chronological cut first, and then everyone says, oh, that's so boring to start at the beginning, and then you put it in the blender and then see. It, it made, there wasn't a natural place to introduce Bernice and Wendell, because I wanted it to have, you know, gravity. It's like, at this point in the film, you're going, okay, where did this woman come from, though, for real? Like, where did she get this space alien musical talent? And then you see them on the couch and it's like almost this like wet Wes Anderson. I'm not comparing my shot to Wes Anderson, but in the way that you kind of introduce this pre these precious people that um, are so smart and then, you know, so funny. Oh, I, we, it, it, made, it made sense at that point in the film. I think earlier on, it, it would have kind of taken some of the mystery away as to who Cheryl was. That makes sense. And there's a moment, you know, that where I feel like it's really evident the trust that was put into this film because, you know, Cheryl, you, you choose, um, I think very smartly to like blur the face of your sons of Levi and Wyatt, like on your social media, on your Instagram, but you were like in this documentary, I will show their faces. Like what felt right about that? Well, there's no denying that they're the most important thing that's ever happened to me. And, um, and sort of in a miraculous way, you know, um, and I don't mean miraculous as in, oh my gosh, it's incredible that I was able to adopt, but more so from a real, I mean, I don't want to say mythical or I don't want to sound woo woo, but you know, um, my life wasn't mapped out exactly what I thought it was going to be like because um, of what I was exposed to. You see my parents who've been married 67 years, um, and you think that's going to be your life, you know, and my children, um, I, you know, without a doubt, I feel pick me, they pick my family. Um, you know, my family stood at the altar with both of my children as their protectors when they were baptized. And, you know, for me, their being present in the story um, is to, that's the, that's the moment, the hallelujah moment, you know, and um and I didn't feel like I was using them in the film and Amy wasn't, um, you know, we, we weren't using them as a means of uh, promoting me. They weren't, you know, social media eyes like a Prada handbag. I mean, they are definitely um, fixtures in my story. So um, that's why they're in there. You know, we, we did film with um because we spent a lot of time at Cheryl's house and she did she trusted us to we, we filmed a lot um with our camera set up and it was you know cinematic looking but then when we got back and we were sort of cutting these scenes uh it did feel it didn't it didn't feel it was like well the only way that you would see these kids is really on cell phone footage of Cheryl or whoever's right there with her like it needed to feel intimate and special and important not like here's a here's a we lit this scene and shot them you know like that just didn't it didn't feel true to you know to who they were that makes sense and you and you did choose to film sort of some like cinematic reenactment sort of things you know footage of like Cheryl as a kid learning how to play the piano I noticed that the actors that you use in those scenes they have your last name is that really well yeah, the children that I did shoot very cinematically um, were only my children. <laughs> <So> <laughs> they they do um, make their way in. Yeah, my daughters are uh, they play young young Cheryl, younger youngest Cheryl and younger Cheryl. Um, and that I bought an upright 1973 Yamaha piano months before the shooting because they want. I told them, and you're gonna have to play piano. And I showed them this picture of Cheryl um like as a five or six year old and she's got her little glasses and her long hair and she's at the piano so they would just stare at that for months and they were like well we want to learn how to put they want to do it method <laughs> so we got a piano and started learning scales and so thank goodness now they're I mean, we paid them didn't we did we pay them they did, not, they did not get paid and they're so my oldest is asking for her sag card so i've got a fantastic come. yeah yeah, it was so much fun to film with them. They, they are precious. They are precious. 
Thank you. I mean, there's this, there's also this footage. I wasn't sure if it was B-roll that you guys shot when you were out together or something, but there's like a kind of series of shots of Cheryl, you're in like a longer sleeve red top, I think. And I was thinking of it as like the kind of day in the life of Cheryl's sequence. We were signing autographs. We just sort of see what it's like being you and having and talking to people all day and signing and signing and signing. Um, where was that footage from? Did you shoot that when you, when you out, went out together? Did you find it from somewhere? Are you speaking of the footage that is sort of happening during a sequence when the metronome is going back and forth and it's like, yeah, signing autographs. That That is um, a filmmaker that was on tour with Cheryl during the Come On, Come On tour. I think it was, yeah. Yeah. And so that was a, we, you know, we generously um, worked with another filmmaker that that had shot a lot of footage. So, and that was some of the more, you know, the heart, the harder behind the scenes um, stuff from backstage that, uh, yeah, I was, that, that would have been, you know, 2003. So I was not around then shooting Cheryl. Yeah, I think, um, I think all that stuff from the from signing autographs and also um, going into a restaurant and being asked, I think that was, you know, it was, it was pretty, um, a pretty honest depiction of things starting to unravel for me. And I mean, it's kind of amazing that we have that footage and that we were, I mean, I wasn't even aware that we had it. Um, and, and the woman that shot it was a very good friend of mine who just happened to be out on the road and she had done some stuff for VH1. And so she always had a camera going. And then um, I think maybe Scooter hooked, hooked mm -hmm. her up with Amy. But a lot of that stuff I didn't even know existed. But it was interesting to watch it because, you know, um, you forget, you know, a lot of times you remember the real high points, but you forget those low moments when things are unraveling and specifically because you don't really want to remember them, you know? And so it was, it, I thought that was, you know, it was hard for me to watch, but it was, I thought it was brilliant that you guys used it because it is a realistic depiction of what I think anybody goes through that is constantly living in, in the public eye and not getting a moment to just be quiet, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's 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 sound effect. Thanks, it's, I mean, since this is an inter international documentary association thing that we're doing, I mean, just in terms of a documentary filmmaker, finding that kind of footage, being able to track down the person that shot it, having that person be so cool and wanting to collaborate. And then just knowing that she didn't turn the camera off, you know, way back when, it was just, you know, it was, it was um, kismet. It was, we're, we're really, really thankful. I mean, as Cheryl mentioned, like your last film was on the director, Hal Ashby. I mean, did you see like a common connection between the two of them that really draws you to the a type of personality you like to yeah. delve into? Definitely, yes. He's, complicated act like you're not here Cheryl these <laughs> okay complicated um artists that do not live perfect lives but that create that that are compelled to make very creative art and are um at every step kind of um uncompromising in in their vision and just stay true to their vision um yeah there's a lot of similarities I'll maybe turn the tables back around because I want to know from Cheryl. I mean, you've worked with so many directors, people pointing cameras at you through your life. Like, what strikes you about Amy as a director? Well, I know Amy knows this. I don't love being in front of the camera. I don't love shooting videos. I mean, I never have. I'm not naturally comfortable in front of a camera. And um, for me, with Amy, it was more like um, talking to a friend, which made it made it a lot easier. And before they sat down with me, they had a really, I think a pretty thorough understanding of not only who I was, but what I'd been through. They'd done a lot of homework. They knew the questions to ask. Um, you know, only in the end when we had to do a few pickup things, was it not a hundred percent natural? You know, most of what is in the movie was just her asking questions and my answering them. And, and I mean, you can tell in, doc, in the documentary, the fact that, um, I mean, there was, there was stuff in there that was hard enough for me to talk that, about that got left in there. You can tell that it's 
Um, that's just the product of my feeling like I had somebody who had my back and that wanted to tell, you know, wanted to tell a beautiful story, but also a story of what it, what one person's journey um, through some real low lows and some in, extremely unnatural highs was like. And um, so I, I felt like I felt like they had my back. We, we did have her back and I I roll with a really small, small crew. And so that means that we're all working. <laughs> so my producer's got a camera, you know, like everybody's on it and no nobody's like messing around. Like it's full, like full on attention, like mindfulness to what she's saying. And so we were, we were extremely invested in Cheryl. And she, the other thing I'll say is that when I would cry, I would look around and they would all be crying. So <laughs> it was a little bit like therapy. <laughs> I do have one last question I want to ask right when we were right as we're wrapping up. Did you consider any titles for the documentary other than Cheryl? Oh yeah, I mean we went I went through tons of, you know, strong enough. Oh, there's like, you know, all the obvious like songs people you want to do it with the songs. Um yeah, and I and I knew I was going to take shit for having making another film where it's just someone's first name. It's like, "Oh, what so now what's next, you know?" Um, but there was no other, it's like, Cheryl is Cheryl. She's unapologetically Cheryl. I mean, that would have been the other answer. Scooter was like, we could just call it unapologetically, unapologetically Cheryl. But that, you know, it, I couldn't come up with anything that was more true to, to her. And I didn't want to tie it to one song, you know? That's funny. That's the first time I've put that together that Hal was called Hal. It still yeah. feels different. I mean, it does still feel different. And, you know, you, you, you certainly don't, you know, all she wants to do is have a little fun. I mean, there, yeah, there's like, a thousand ridiculous titles, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I every think day it's a winning road. We went down the mall and it was like, yes, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah, no. <laughs> well, Amy Scott, Cheryl Crow, thank you so much for this conversation. This has been such a joy getting to talk to you about the film. Congratulations to both of you. Um, I also want to thank our interpreter again, Andrea Lust. Thank you so much for, for being you, being having the best fingers in the business. Um, and yes, uh, thank you out there watching. Thank you for joining us to the IDA Awards Spotlight Series. Again, um, if you would like to come and keep checking out the rest of our Spotlight lineup, we are at www.documentary.org awards spotlight. So thank you all for being here. And thanks again. Thanks again, Amy and Cheryl. Such a pleasure. Thanks, Amy. Amy Scott, I love you. Love you. And too. Thank you, Amy, for having us.